In the early days of humanity's venture into the cosmos, the scene at the United Nations Space Command was one of controlled chaos. Engineers, scientists, and government officials were all gathered around the central hollow table, displaying the blueprints of what would be humanity's first iron vessel capable of faster-than-light travel. Are we really going to do this with iron? Questioned Dr. Ava Singh, one of the lead engineers. It's not exactly cutting-edge material. General Marcus Winters, overseeing the project, responded firmly, it's not about the material, Dr. Singh. It's about proving that we can reach the stars. Iron or not, this ship will carry humanity into a new era. The room buzzed with activity as teams worked tirelessly to finalize the designs. The propulsion system was particularly a topic of intense discussion. The method was crude, relying on brute force to break the lightspeed barrier, but it was the best they had. We've got to make sure these engines can handle the stress, said another engineer, his eyes glued to the schematics. Any miscalculation could mean disaster. As the vessel, christened the Pioneer, was constructed, news of humanity's bold endeavor spread throughout the world. People watched with bated breath as the Pioneer underwent its final checks before the historic launch. On launch day, the UNSC command center was filled with an air of anticipation. The Pioneer stood ready on the launch pad, a testament to human determination. Commencing countdown, announced the launch director. T minus 10, 9, 8. The Pioneer roared to life, its engines igniting with a fury that shook the ground. As it ascended into the sky, a collective cheer erupted from the crowd. In the following months, humanity's presence in space grew. The Galactic Council, a body representing advanced civilizations, took note of the newcomers. Initial reports on humans were laced with condescension. Have you seen their ships? Made of iron and propelled by sheer force, laughed Ambassador Zylo from the Council. How quaint! Yet, despite the ridicule, humans continued their journey. Their FTL travel, though primitive, was effective. They lacked instantaneous communication, which meant messages took time to travel, but they managed. The Galactic Council convened to discuss the human issue. They're a curious species, observed Counselor Trell. Primitive, yes, but there's something about their spirit. Ambassador Zylo scoffed. Let's not get carried away. They're an amusing addition, nothing more. As the Pioneer and its sister ships explored the cosmos, humanity's reputation began to shift. Their vessels might have been simple, but they were sturdy and reliable. General Winters, we've established contact with several alien species reported Captain Lee, the Pioneer's commander. They're wary but intrigued by our presence. Good, replied General Winters. Show them what humanity is capable of. We may not have the fanciest technology, but we have determination. The Galactic Council's acknowledgement of humanity was begrudging at best. Yet, as humans proved themselves capable of surviving and even thriving in space, that acknowledgement turned into a cautious respect. Perhaps we underestimated these humans, conceded Counselor Terrell. Their tenacity is admirable. The Galactic Council was not prepared for the tenacity of humanity. The humans, with their iron ships and brute force engines, had not only reached the stars but had also begun to weave themselves into the fabric of galactic society. Their approach was unorthodox, bypassing the formalities that the Council held in high regard. In the bustling trade hub of Citadel Space, a human merchant ship, the Nomad, docked alongside sleek alien vessels. Captain Elena Mora led her crew with a blend of charm and shrewdness that quickly made an impression. Captain Mora, to what do we owe the pleasure? Asked a Solarian trader, his voice echoing through the crowded marketplace. We come with goods from Earth and beyond, Elena replied, gesturing to the crates being unloaded. Technology, resources, you name it, we're here to trade. The Solarian chuckled. You humans are bold, I'll give you that. Bypassing the Council's channels? Risky business. Elena smiled. We prefer to think of it as efficient. Why wait for approval when we can make mutually beneficial deals right now? Word of the humans' direct dealing spread, and soon enough, they had established a network of contacts throughout Citadel space. Their resilience was evident 
They adapted quickly to new environments and thrived where others hesitated. On a newly settled planet, a human diplomat, Lucas Grant, negotiated with the local authorities. We understand the challenges of this environment, he said. Our terraforming technology can make this place more hospitable for all of us. The officials were skeptical but intrigued. And what do you ask in return, Mr. Grant? Partnership, Lucas stated. Together, we can create a thriving community here. Back at the Galactic Council, the humans' actions were a topic of heated debate. They're circumventing our procedures, complained Ambassador Zylo. This cannot continue. Counselor Terrell, however, saw potential. Their methods are unconventional, but they're getting results. Perhaps there's something to be learned from their tenacity. As human traders continued to peddle their wares, they became known for their reliability and spirit. They faced challenges head-on, and their word was as solid as the iron hulls of their ships. Captain Mora, your reputation precedes you, said a Zentari buyer. We're interested in your energy converters. Elena nodded. You'll find our technology reliable and our terms fair. Let's discuss. The Galactic Council eventually had to acknowledge the humans' growing influence. Their trade agreements spanned across the cosmos, and their alliances grew stronger with each passing cycle. Perhaps we were too quick to judge, admitted Counselor Terrell. The humans have proven themselves resourceful. And so, the humans, once seen as a cosmic joke, had become tenacious peddlers, integral to the galactic economy. Their journey had only just begun, but their impact was undeniable. As humanity's presence in the galaxy expanded, their ability to adapt became their hallmark. The humans, once seen as a cosmic novelty, were now a common sight across Citadel space. Their adaptability was not just a trait, but a survival mechanism that allowed them to thrive in environments that were initially hostile to their biology. The human settlements on the planet Eridani Delta were a testament to this adaptability. The planet, with its harsh climate and rugged terrain, was not an ideal location for colonization. Yet, the humans had not only survived but had started to transform the planet. Commander Sarah Chan, the leader of the Eridani Delta colony, stood before a gathering of settlers and local species representatives. When we first arrived, this planet was a challenge, she began. But together, we've turned it into a home. A Moroccan delegate, a species known for their resilience, nodded in agreement. Your people have done what many thought impossible. You've made Eridani Delta livable. The human's knack for survival was not the only thing that caught the attention of the galaxy. Their culture, once confined to Earth, was now being shared and embraced by other species. Human music played in alien marketplaces, and human cuisine was served in interstellar eateries. In the corridors of the Galactic Council, the topic of humanity's ubiquity was a recurring theme. They're everywhere, remarked Ambassador Zylo with a hint of annoyance. One cannot travel without encountering a human or their influence. Counselor Terrell, however, saw a different picture. They've become a part of the galactic community, he said. Their ability to adapt is remarkable. The human's integration into the galaxy was not without its challenges. Prejudices and misunderstandings were common in the early days. But as time passed, those barriers began to break down, and humans were increasingly seen as equals. On the trading floor of the Citadel, a human merchant named Alexei conversed with a group of alien traders. Our technology may not be as advanced, he said, but it's reliable and easy to repair. That counts for something out here. The traders murmured in agreement. The humans had earned a reputation for their straightforward technology and the tenacity to make it work in any situation. The phrase, the humans are here, had shifted in meaning. Once a statement of mild derision, it was now a sign of opportunity and potential. Human settlements were known for their open doors and the chance for prosperity they offered. As the humans continued to adapt and integrate, their role in the galaxy grew. They were no longer the underdogs. They were becoming a part of the very fabric of galactic society. Commander Chen, your request for additional terraforming equipment has been approved, said a council aide. The council recognizes the value of your work. Sarah smiled. Thank you. We'll put it to good use. 
Eridani Delta is just the beginning. The transformation of inhospitable planets into welcoming homes was a feat that not only showcased humanity's ingenuity, but also their unyielding drive to expand their horizons. Terraforming, the process of altering a planet's environment to resemble Earth's, became a cornerstone of human space colonization efforts. The project on Mars served as a prime example of this pioneering spirit. The Red Planet, once a barren landscape, was slowly turning green under the careful guidance of the terraforming committee. Dr. Emily Zhao, the head of the committee, addressed her team during a routine briefing. The atmospheric processors are working at full capacity, she reported. We're seeing a steady increase in oxygen levels. Her second-in-command, Lieutenant Commander Raj Patel, nodded in agreement. The ice caps are responding well to the thermal charges. We're on track for the next phase. The work was grueling, and the challenges were many. From the unpredictable weather patterns to the delicate balance of introducing new flora and fauna, every step required meticulous planning and execution. Remember, we're not just making this planet livable for us, Dr. Zhao reminded her team. We're creating an ecosystem that can sustain itself for generations to come. The news of Mars transformation reached far and wide. Other species observed with interest as humans took a lifeless rock and turned it into a thriving world. At a conference held on the Citadel, human representatives presented their progress. Mars is just the beginning, declared Ambassador Lucas Grant. Our techniques can be applied to countless other worlds. A murmur of approval rippled through the assembly. The idea of transforming dead planets into vibrant habitats was appealing to many. In the corridors of power, the Galactic Council took note of humanity's achievements. They're changing the face of the galaxy, said Councillor Terrell. Their terraforming projects could lead to a new era of expansion. Even Ambassador Zylo, who had often been critical of humans, had to concede their success. I must admit, their determination is impressive, he said begrudgingly. The terraforming of Mars became a beacon of hope for struggling colonies across the galaxy. It was proof that with enough willpower and innovation, any challenge could be overcome. Dr. Zhao, the latest reports from Mars are promising, said Commander Chun from Eridani Delta. Your work is inspiring our own efforts here. Emily smiled. We're all in this together, Commander. What we learn on Mars will help every human colony. As the Martian sky turned from red to blue, and the first drops of rain fell on its surface, humanity's role as terraforming pioneers was cemented. They had turned science fiction into science fact, and in doing so had opened up new possibilities for life in the cosmos. The galactic economy was on the brink of a revolution, and humanity was at its forefront. The traditional trade routes and bureaucratic processes of the Galactic Council had long been the only way to conduct business across the stars. However, humans, with their unique method of FTL travel and a penchant for direct negotiation, were about to change all that. In the heart of the galaxy, on a space station that served as a crossroads for traders, a human merchant named Javier Morales was making deals that would have been unthinkable a few years prior. His ship, the Venture, was loaded with goods from all corners of human space, ready to be traded without the Council's oversight. Mr. Morales, you do realize that your actions could be considered unconventional? Inquired an alien trader, his tone a mix of curiosity and caution. Javier responded with a confident smile. Unconventional, maybe, but effective? Absolutely. We're offering quality goods, fair prices, and no red tape. That's what the galaxy needs. The venture became a symbol of this new era of trade. It wasn't just about the goods being exchanged. It was about the relationships being built. Humanity's approach was personal, direct, and it resonated with many who were tired of the council's slow and often corrupt system. On a remote mining planet, a human negotiator, Lena Kovac, was finalizing a deal that would secure a steady supply of rare minerals for human colonies. We don't need to go through the council, she explained to the planet's governor. Let's make a deal that benefits us both directly. The governor, an imposing figure from a species known for their mining prowess, nodded in agreement. Your proposal is straightforward. I appreciate that. Back on Earth, 
the United Nations Space Command, UNSC, monitored the progress of these new trade routes. Admiral Sofia Ramirez addressed the assembly. Our traders are establishing a network that rivals the Council's. We're not just participants in the galactic economy. We're becoming leaders. The Council, meanwhile, was in turmoil. They're bypassing our protocols, protested Ambassador Zylo. This is anarchy. Counselor Terrell, however, saw the bigger picture. It's not anarchy, Zylo. It's evolution. The humans are showing us a better way to trade. As human traders continued to forge new paths, their influence grew. The venture and ships like it were now common sights in the busiest ports of the galaxy. Their holds full of goods and their crews ready to negotiate. Captain Morales, your reputation precedes you, said a merchant from a distant system. We've heard of your fair dealings. We're interested in what you have to offer. Javier shook the merchant's hand, a human gesture that had become a sign of trust and respect among traders. You won't be disappointed, he assured. The trade revolution had begun and humanity was at its helm. They had shown the galaxy that there was a different way to do business, one that was based on mutual benefit and respect rather than bureaucracy and backroom deals. Admiral Ramirez, the latest reports are in, said a young officer. Our trade network now spans half the galaxy. Sophia looked out at the stars, a sense of pride filling her. Keep pushing forward, she said. This is just the beginning. Within the polished halls of the Galactic Council, a shadow had fallen. The Council, once a beacon of unity and cooperation, had become entangled in a web of political intrigue and power plays. At the center of this turmoil was the fate of the Thalassians, a species whose influence had waned due to the Council's covert operations. Counselor Gaius, a veteran member known for his strategic acumen, convened a secret meeting. The Thalassians have become a liability, he declared. Their fall from grace will serve as a lesson to others who challenge the status quo. Ambassador Zylo, who had always harbored a disdain for the humans, saw an opportunity. With the Thalassians gone, we can tighten our grip on the trade routes. The humans' rise has been inconvenient. The Council's decision was swift and merciless. The Thalassians were to be exiled, their territories seized, and their status revoked. It was a sentence that would lead to their certain demise. On Thalassia Prime, the news of their exile spread like wildfire. Prime Minister Vela, a leader of great dignity, addressed her people. We have been betrayed, she said, her voice steady despite the gravity of the situation. But we will not go quietly into the night. The Thalassians prepared for the worst, but hope was scarce. Their military, once formidable, had been systematically dismantled by the Council's sanctions. In the human territories, the news of the Thalassians' plight reached the UNSC. Admiral Sofia Ramirez called an emergency meeting. The Council has overstepped, she stated. The Thalassians were our rivals, yes, but they do not deserve this fate. The room was filled with tension as officers and diplomats debated their course of action. If we intervene, we risk the Council's wrath, said one officer. But if we do nothing, we allow an injustice to occur under our watch, countered another. The decision was made. Humanity would extend a hand to the Thalassians. It was a move that would alter the course of galactic politics forever. As the Thalassian world braced for the end, a fleet of human ships appeared in their skies. Commander Sarachan, who had led the terraforming efforts on Eridani Delta, was now in command of the rescue operation. Prime Minister Vela, we come in peace, she communicated. Humanity offers you aid. We will not stand by and watch your people suffer. The Thalassians, stunned by this show of solidarity, accepted the offer. The human's intervention was swift and decisive. Supplies, resources, and protection were provided, and the Thalassians found refuge within human-controlled space. The Galactic Council watched in disbelief as their plans unraveled. The humans have made a mockery of our authority, fumed Counselor Gaius. Ambassador Zylo was equally perturbed. This changes everything, he admitted. The humans are no longer mere participants. They are contenders. The humans' actions sent ripples throughout the galaxy. Their military, which had been underestimated, 
was now recognized as a force to be reckoned with. The Thalassians, once on the brink of extinction, found new life among their former adversaries. Commander Chen, your actions have saved our people, said Prime Minister Vela, her voice filled with gratitude. We will never forget this. Sarah nodded solemnly. Today we are more than allies. We are family. The galaxy watched in awe as humanity extended its hand in a display of solidarity to the Thalassians, a species on the brink of annihilation. This act of kindness was unprecedented, especially given the history of rivalry between the two species. The Galactic Council, which had orchestrated the Thalassians' downfall, could only observe in stunned silence as their plans were appended by the very species they had once dismissed. Admiral Sofia Ramirez stood before the United Nations Space Command, her expression solemn yet determined. We have a moral obligation, she began, addressing the assembly of human leaders and military officers. The Thalassians are in dire need, and we have the means to help them. Her words resonated with the assembly, and the decision was unanimous. A fleet of human ships, led by the flagship defender, would set course for Thalassia Prime to provide aid and sanctuary. As the defender entered Thalassian space, Commander Sarah Chun, who had been instrumental in the terraforming efforts on Eridani Delta, now found herself at the helm of a mission of mercy. Prime Minister Vela, we are here to offer support, she communicated to the Thalassian leader. You are not alone. The response from Prime Minister Vela was filled with a mixture of relief and gratitude. Admiral Ramirez, Commander Chun, your actions today will be remembered. You have our eternal thanks. The human fleet worked tirelessly, transporting Thalassian refugees to safety, providing medical aid, and supplying essential resources. The sight of human and Thalassian working side by side was a powerful one, and it sent a clear message to the rest of the galaxy. Humanity was a force of unity. In the Galactic Council's chambers, the mood was tense. Counselor Gaius faced criticism from his peers. Your schemes have backfired, they accused. Humanity has shown us up. Even Ambassador Zylo had to acknowledge the shift in power dynamics. We underestimated the humans, he admitted. Their display of solidarity has changed everything. The humans' intervention had far-reaching consequences. The Thalassians, once a proud and influential species, were now indebted to humanity. This debt forged a strong alliance, one that would alter the balance of power in the galaxy. On Thalassia Prime, the rebuilding process began. With human aid, the Thalassians started to recover from the brink of destruction. We will rise again, vowed Prime Minister Vela, and we will do so with our new allies by our side. The display of solidarity was not just about providing immediate aid. It was about building a future. Humanity's actions had sown the seeds of hope and cooperation, which would grow into a mighty tree whose branches would shelter many species across the stars. Commander Chan, the Thalassians have offered to share their knowledge of advanced propulsion systems, reported an officer. This alliance will benefit us all. Sarah nodded, a sense of pride swelling within her. Let's make sure we honor this partnership. Together, we are stronger. The story of humanity's solidarity with the Thalassians became a beacon of hope. It was a tale that would be told for generations, a reminder that even in the darkest of times, unity could prevail. The phrase, the humans are here, had once elicited laughter and scorn. Now it inspired respect and gratitude. Humanity had shown the galaxy that their spirit was not just one of survival but of profound solidarity. The galaxy had never witnessed such a rapid rise to prominence as it did with humanity. From their first awkward steps into the cosmos, humans had now positioned themselves as a central hub of galactic trade and diplomacy. The Galactic Council, once the unchallenged authority in space, found itself having to contend with humanity's growing influence. At the heart of humanity's ascent was their unique method of faster-than-light FTL travel. It was not the most elegant solution, but it was uniquely human, robust, adaptable, and surprisingly efficient. This allowed them to establish trade routes that bypassed the traditional lanes controlled by the Council, offering faster and more direct access to goods and resources. Admiral Sofia Ramirez stood before the newly formed Human Trade Alliance, HTA, 
a body representing the collective interests of human colonies and trade organizations. Our position in the galaxy is stronger than ever, she declared. Our trade network is expanding, and our diplomatic ties are strengthening. We are no longer just survivors. We are pioneers, leaders, and partners. The HTA had become a beacon of innovation and cooperation. Its members worked tirelessly to ensure that trade was fair, disputes were settled amicably, and that all species could benefit from the prosperity that was now possible. On the bridge of the Defender, Commander Sarah Chun received a transmission from an alien world seeking to join the HTA. We have heard of your fair dealings and wish to be part of this new order, said the alien representative. Sarah responded with a nod. We welcome all who seek mutual prosperity. Let's discuss how we can work together. The Galactic Council's chambers were abuzz with discussions about humanity's new role. They have become indispensable, admitted Counselor Trell. Their trade network rivals our own, and their diplomatic efforts have brought stability to regions we thought were lost. Even Ambassador Zylo, who had always viewed humans with skepticism, had to concede their success. Their ascent is a testament to their resilience, he said, albeit reluctantly. Humanity's influence extended beyond trade and politics. Their culture, once confined to Earth, was now celebrated across the galaxy. Human art, music, and cuisine were enjoyed on countless worlds, and their language became a common tongue for interspecies communication. In the halls of the United Nations Space Command, leaders and strategists planned for the future. Our alliances are our strength, said General Marcus Winters. We must continue to build bridges, not just between worlds, but between hearts and minds. The humans had indeed ascended. They had gone from being the underdogs of the galaxy to one of its key players. Their journey was a testament to their indomitable spirit and their unwavering commitment to forging a better future for all. Admiral Ramirez, the latest reports indicate that our influence continues to grow, reported an aide. New species are seeking alliances, and our trade routes are flourishing. Sophia looked out at the stars, her eyes reflecting the resolve that had brought humanity this far. We have a responsibility to lead by example, she said. Let's ensure that our ascent benefits not just humanity, but the entire galaxy. The transformation of the Galactic Council was not merely a change in policy or leadership. It was a fundamental shift in the very structure of galactic governance. Humanity's ascent had brought with it a new vision for the galaxy, one that emphasized inclusivity, cooperation, and the sharing of knowledge and resources. The old order, characterized by rigid hierarchies and slow-moving bureaucracy, was giving way to a more dynamic and responsive system. At the forefront of this new order was the Human Trade Alliance, HTA, which had grown from a loose association of traders into a powerful body capable of shaping policy and directing the flow of commerce throughout the galaxy. Its influence was felt in every corner of space, from the bustling trade hubs to the most remote outposts. Admiral Sofia Ramirez, now serving as the HTA's High Commissioner, addressed the Assembly of Species Representatives. The galaxy is changing, she said. We must be willing to adapt, to learn from each other, and to build a future that benefits all. Her words were met with nods of agreement from the Assembly. The HTA had proven that a more flexible approach to trade and diplomacy could yield impressive results. On the newly terraformed world of New Eden, a joint human Thalassian settlement, discussions were underway to establish a regional council that would serve as a model for the new galactic order. Prime Minister Vela of the Thalassians sat with Commander Sarah Chun and other leaders to draft the charter. We have an opportunity to create something unique here, said Vela a council that truly represents the diversity of its constituents. Sarah added, It's about more than just representation. It's about making sure every voice is heard and every concern is addressed. The Galactic Council, once the sole authority, had to evolve. Councillor Terrell led the charge for reform. We must embrace this new order, he urged his fellow councillors. The humans have shown us that there is strength in unity and diversity. Even Ambassador Zylo, who had long resisted change, found himself swayed by the winds of transformation. The Council must adapt or become irrelevant, he conceded. 
the restructuring of the council's influence was not without its challenges. There were those who clung to the old ways, fearful of losing power. But the success of the HTA and the example set by New Eden were undeniable. In the halls of the United Nations Space Command, strategists and diplomats worked alongside alien advisors to ensure that the transition to the new order was smooth and equitable. Our goal is to facilitate cooperation, not to dominate, said General Marcus Winters. The legacy of humanity's ascent was clear. They had not only found their place among the stars, but had also helped to forge a new path for the galaxy. The new order was one of shared prosperity and mutual respect, a far cry from the days of isolation and suspicion. High Commissioner Ramirez, the latest reports indicate that more systems are adopting the new Eden model, reported in aid. Sophia looked out at the stars, a sense of accomplishment and hope filling her. Keep supporting them, she said. This is the dawn of a new era for the galaxy. The culmination of humanity's journey in the cosmos was not marked by a singular event or a grandiose spectacle. It was encapsulated in the everyday lives of the people who had ventured into the unknown, driven by a spirit that refused to be confined to the cradle of Earth. This spirit was not just a testament to human endurance and ingenuity. It was a beacon that lit the way for all species in the galaxy. In the sprawling metropolis of New Terra, a planet once barren and now teeming with life, the United Nations Space Command, UNSC, had established its headquarters. Here, leaders from various human colonies and allied species gathered to celebrate the anniversary of the first FTL jump made by humanity. Admiral Sofia Ramirez stood at the podium, her voice echoing through the Grand Hall. Today, we commemorate not just a leap through space, but a leap of faith, she said. Faith in ourselves, in our potential, and in the unity that we have built among the stars. The audience, a mosaic of beings from across the galaxy, listened intently. The story of humanity's ascent was known to all, a narrative that had been woven into the fabric of galactic culture. In the crowd, Commander Sarah Chun shared a moment with Prime Minister Vela. Who would have thought, Sarah mused, that our two species would stand together like this? Vela replied, it is the human spirit that has brought us here. Your willingness to reach out, to help those in need, has changed the galaxy. The celebration was not just about the past. It was about the future. The UNSC had unveiled plans for a new initiative, the Intergalactic Outreach Program, aimed at assisting developing worlds. It was an ambitious project, one that would require the cooperation of many species. We have a responsibility continued Admiral Ramirez. The knowledge and resources we have amassed must be used to uplift others, to ensure that no world is left behind. The outreach program was met with widespread support. Species that had once viewed humanity with skepticism now offered their expertise and resources to the cause. On a distant frontier world, a team of human engineers worked alongside alien counterparts to build a water purification system. This will change their lives, said engineer Maya Lopez, as she instructed a group of local inhabitants on the system's operation. Her alien colleague, a Gorvian named Threx, nodded in agreement. Your people have a gift for making the impossible seem possible, he said. The testament to the human spirit was not found in monuments or accolades, but in the lives that had been touched by humanity's actions. From the bustling trade routes to the quiet corners of the galaxy where aid was most needed, the impact of humanity's journey was felt. In the halls of the Galactic Council, a new era of cooperation had dawned. The humans have taught us much, said Counselor Terrell. Their spirit has inspired a galaxy. As the celebrations continued, stories were shared. Tales of human bravery, of compassion, of the relentless drive to explore and connect. These stories would become legends, passed down through generations, inspiring others to reach for the stars. Admiral Ramirez, the outreach program is ready to launch, reported an aid. Sophia looked out at the assembly, her heart full. Then let us begin, she said, for it is in giving that we receive, and it is in sharing that we find our true purpose.